Right now on Currents News, after Easter comes Easter Tide. Church leaders are using this time to fill up the pews. It's an excellent opportunity to really put your hand out and bring people back. Plus, a pop-up vaccination site is helping a neighborhood hit hard by the pandemic. A prominent doctor gunned down in his home, the community now remembering him as a man of faith. Genuine. He was a very genuine man. And England in mourning. Prince Philip passes away at 99. Catholic leaders are offering their condolences. Hello, I'm Christine Persichetti. This Sunday is the first since celebrating Christ's resurrection. We are now in Eastertide, but what does that mean? Jessica Easthope spoke with clergy about the season and how they're using it to bring people back to the church. This rising from the dead signified... It's common knowledge that Easter marks the end of Lent, but it also marks a beginning, another part of the Easter season that goes on for almost two months. And it's continued for the 50 days until the Feast of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's a very special time. It's called Eastertide, the time between Easter and Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus' disciples on the seventh Sunday after Church Easter. For the 50 days, this is a constant reminder that Jesus is the light of the world. Monsignor Jesus David Casado says the Polish, Irish and Italians have their own ways of celebrating Easter Monday and observing this time. Most people in Italy take the day off and they go to the country and celebrate all the leftovers, all the leftover food. You do divine mercy. Nila Ruggieri and Vittoria Spagnolo say Eastertide is a time to live the joy of Easter and the hope of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit comes and enables us with this power, with this strength and with this joy. And that was the way to go to the disciples and show He's there with us. I say the rosaries every day, at least 15 a day. On any given day, you can find Carlo Formasano at St. Athanasius, alone, praying the rosary. For him, Eastertide is a time to give, using the power of the Holy Spirit to help others. You get that spirit, the Holy Spirit, to come into you, like he gave it to the disciples. If you could feel that just for one day, it's the best feeling in the world. Monsignor Casado says it's also the best time of year for evangelization. Why is it the perfect time of the year to bring people into church and back to church? It's interesting because during this Eastertide, after this pandemic, it's time to reach out to people that have fallen away. It's an excellent opportunity to really put your hand out and bring people back. This year, Eastertide is celebrated until May 23rd, the Feast of Pentecost. In Bensonhurst, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. This Sunday marks Divine Mercy Sunday, an annual celebration about the mercy of God that's centered around an image painted by St. Faustina. Net TV will air the Vatican's Divine Mercy Mass. Just tune in this Sunday, April 11th at 3 p.m. New York made some major updates to its vaccination plan this week, opening up eligibility to people 16 and over. Another big change in the Big Apple, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced schools need at least four positive cases in different classrooms to temporarily close. Previously, only two unrelated cases could shut down a school. If there are two or three cases in a school, the building will remain open while the affected classes will go remote for 10 days. The city is citing new science behind the spread of COVID-19 and increased vaccinations for the change in policy. But as more people are vaccinated, some communities are falling behind others, particularly neighborhoods in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Emily Juby spoke with health experts to find out why. Lines of people around the corner waiting for one of the country's most precious commodities, a COVID vaccine, but distribution hasn't been even. The vaccination rate among the black community is still lagging. 28 and 26 percent of the Asian and white communities have been vaccinated, but only 15 and 14 percent of the black and Latino communities have been. Location has also been a factor. City data shows while in Manhattan, 34 percent of people have received at least one shot. That number drops down to only 23 percent in the Bronx and Brooklyn. The difference is stark on the east side. In historically lower income areas like Central and East Harlem, only 12 
to 15% are fully vaccinated. But just down the road on the Upper East Side, those numbers jump from 26 to 31%. One reason the difficulty of scheduling an appointment. So those that may be working from home and have the ability to spend 30 minutes every morning at 7 a.m. trying to get an appointment is a lot different from someone who's working in a service industry where they need to be out the door at 6 a.m. and at work at 7. Dr. Shawnee Andre says adding weekends and off-hour slots at vaccination sites helps address this. She's the medical director for the Floating Hospital, a nonprofit which provides free health care to those in need. She also says education is crucial. The Floating Hospital has been busing seniors in to get the shot. They've also focused their vaccine and education efforts. To target those populations that are either public housing, homeless, or limited English proficiency, and just making sure that we are offering first to those communities. This city is trying to address the discrepancies to announcing community pop up vaccination sites. This is why we open so many NYSHA centers, churches, uh, House of Prey and the Yankee Stadium in the Bronx with the people from the Bronx. Access is key, explains Dr. Ramon Talaj. He's the board chairman of Somos Community Care, which provides medical services to those in underserved communities. He was on hand as Governor Andrew Cuomo announced the Roll Up Your Sleeve campaign, where houses of worship can sign up to host pop-up vaccination sites. It launches in April. Somos is also pushing the state to allow community doctors to give out shots so people feel more comfortable. In Brooklyn, Emily Druby, Currents News. St. Leo's Church in Corona is now open for vaccinations. It's the second site at a Catholic church in the neighborhood hard hit by the virus. The Johnson & Johnson shots are all being administered in the church's basement and more than 125 people a day are making appointments. Some young people were in line. That's because New Yorkers 16 and older are now eligible. In Corona, there have been more than 10,000 cases and 500 deaths, leaving everyone lining up today saying they are relieved and grateful. I am believe in God and I have to pray to the God for the vaccine, for the people to protect your life. As my doctor says it's better to have the vaccine and probably, you know, some second reaction than to have the, the virus because the virus can kill you. And this, I mean, this is a protection. The city-run pop-up clinic will be open until Sunday from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. To make an appointment, call 877-829-4692. Remember, an appointment is required. Corona is home to a large immigrant community, and reports now suggest half are unemployed. The crisis isn't just affecting them at home, but it's affecting their families abroad, the ones they send money back to. Jessica Easthope spoke to immigrants in Sunnyside about the challenges they face. More than 270 million migrants living and working abroad send money back to their home countries every year, according to the United Nations. But as the pandemic, financial struggles and unemployment consumed New York City's undocumented population, the Wall Street Journal reported the amount of money sent back to Central and South America has surged. So how? That's why I try to control here, don't buy nothing extra, and we'd be able to send something. Juan Sarmiento is an example of how families here are putting their own financial pain on the back burner in order to support their loved ones back home. Sometimes they need more than us because you know how in our countries is the very, very poor people. Okay. Juan kept his job with a pest control company throughout the pandemic, but with rising prices of food and utilities, his family has done without in order to send money home to Ecuador to family who takes care of his mom, who had a stroke nearly two years ago. She needs attention like almost 24 hours a day. Sometimes it makes me cry, but the main thing is my family. But there's a flip side to this coin. Because the family depends on my, my money. And me not working is terrible because the bill's not waiting. I pay. Luceli Bravo says she used to send up to $500 a month back to her sister and parents in Mexico. But since work as a cleaning lady during the pandemic is scarce, most months all she can afford is $15. She says her teenage daughter here is the priority, but the stress and guilt are unimaginable. The internet is, is very important because the school is closed. Father Nestor Martinez hears stories like Lucely's all the time. In confession, we, we hear a lot about that. Many people lost their jobs and uh, they are not able to raise enough money to support the, both families. 
and he can relate because he's supporting his parents back in Colombia. Father Nestor says for Latin American immigrants, sending money home is closely tied to their faith. Latin America is very Catholic and to honor our parents and in one way that we show our respect and our love to them is by supporting them economically. In spite of the hardship the pandemic has put on immigrants here in the United States, Latin American families are determined to not let it reach home. In Sunnyside, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Medical experts delivered critical testimony on George Floyd's death at the trial of the former officer accused of killing him. Among those taking the stand Friday was the medical examiner who performed Floyd's autopsy. His report declared Floyd's death a homicide, but ruled the cause was cardiopulmonary arrest, not asphyxia. But medical experts have testified oxygen levels can be difficult to detect in an autopsy, and Floyd's heart appeared normal. I don't normally photograph organs that appear to be per perfectly normal um, unless there's some reason to. His heart was enlarged by weight, but that wouldn't really be something you could capture in a photograph. He also went on to say Floyd's arteries were shrunken and believes drugs and heart disease did play a role in his death. A South Carolina community is warning a beloved and well-known doctor. Police say Dr. Robert Leslie, his wife Barbara, and their two grandchildren were shot and killed Tuesday by former NFL player Philip Adams. He later killed himself. Flowers and cards sit outside his medical office as patients past and present praise Leslie's warmth, diligence, and devotion to God. He was a man of faith. You know, I felt that he, his knowledge and his expertise were there, and I could always feel confident that I got the right answer. For the past 25 years, Leslie took care of thousands of patients in the South Carolina area. He frequently wrote of the fragility of life and a deep-seated Christian faith that guided him personally and professionally, compiling some of his most memorable emergency room experiences into a book called Angels in the ER. Prince Philip, the husband of England's Queen Elizabeth, has died. Buckingham Palace announcing the Duke of Edinburgh's passing away peacefully at the age of 99. Prince Philip being described as an enormous support for the Queen by a former member of palace staff, often going with her on royal trips and visits like this one to the Vatican in 2014. The Catholic community in England also mourning the loss. The president of the Catholic Bishops Conference of England and Wales releasing a statement saying, I pray for the repose of the soul of Prince Philip, Her Majesty the Queen's faithful and loyal husband. I pray for the Queen and all of the royal family. How much we will miss Prince Philip's presence and character, so full of life and vigor. There's a lot more news headed your way. A global vaccine effort kicks off as 38 million doses make their way around the world. It's the most important time to share vaccines equitably and protect health workers and at-risk communities. The World Health Organization urging the international community to donate vaccines to countries in need. Plus, a look at how Catholic high school students are lending a hand on their time off from class. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. Vaccination efforts are ramping up around the globe. The World Health Organization is distributing more than 38 million doses to over 100 countries under the COVAX initiative. The global vaccine sharing program aims to provide equal access to vaccines for all nations. Getting vaccines to those who need it most is something Pope Francis has been urging governments around the world to do. It's been a challenge, but the Holy Father repeated that message during this Easter season. Esorto pertanto l'intera comunità internazionale a un impegno condiviso per superare i ritardi nella loro distribuzione e favorirne la condivisione, specialmente con i paesi più poveri. 
The international community faces many obstacles in achieving this goal. Among them is getting developed nations to give vaccines to countries that can't afford them. The World Health Organization and humanitarian groups have responded to this challenge by creating COVAX, a program designed to vaccinate healthcare workers and high risk individuals in both developed and developing nations. The aim of COVAX is to distribute 2 billion doses to developing nations in 2021. Last week, I made an urgent request to countries with doses of vaccines that have to WHO emergency use listing to share 10 million doses immediately with COVAX. I also requested manufacturers to help ensure that the countries that step up can rapidly donate those doses. This challenge has been heard, but we're yet to receive commitments for these doses. The other challenge to what the Pope is calling the internationalization of vaccines is the internal distribution within poor countries. For example, the Democratic Republic of the Congo received a shipment of vaccines on March 3rd. One month later, they haven't been touched. A lack of medical personnel and crumbling infrastructure have prevented their distribution. I know this is a challenging time for many countries as cases and hospitalizations are spiking. But conversely, it's when cases and when cases are spiking that it's the most important time to share vaccines equitably and protect health workers and at risk communities. COVAX distributed its first vaccine on February 25th when it delivered 600,000 doses to Ghana. Meanwhile, the U.S. and the U.K. began their vaccination drives more than two months earlier in December. In New York City, an effort is underway to vaccinate the homeless. They have been hit especially hard with no health care and many without the means to get a stimulus check. Current News' Jessica Easthope has more from Staten Island on the effort to get them inoculated. Eating, sleeping, and cooking outside in the bitter cold. On days when the wind is whipping, the homeless population takes on another risk during the pandemic. Homelessness is on the brink of, of becoming uh, a pandemic itself. According to the latest data from the Department of Homeless Services, more than 53,000 people sleep in New York City shelters every day. Nearly 90% of them are black and Hispanic, communities that have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. This is the shed that houses our beds. Reverend Terry Troya, the president of Project Hospitality, advocates for them and for the street homeless who live in encampments like this one. During the pandemic, Project Hospitality was the only church-based shelter network in the city to stay open. This last year, we have seen an unprecedented number of homeless people hunker down in encampments, people that were forced out uh, very early in COVID, uh, some as a result of losing their jobs in COVID. Homeless people across New York City have been eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine for several weeks. So far, the city has administered more than 7,500 vaccines to social and homeless services clients. The city has been using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The most important thing is to get people vaccinated so they don't get so sick. You need that the one shot, I think, is, is the solution for people who may not make it back a second time. This is now their home. Reverend Troya says the recent explosion of homelessness in New York City can be turned around if everyone does their part, especially during the season of Lent. Almsgiving is giving money or giving your talent or your service to the poor. If our lives revolved around those three pillars every day, not just 40 days, we would be a holier and a more healthy world. The city has been vaccinating people in the shelters where they live and working with its street medicine program to vaccinate people living outdoors. On Staten Island, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Habitat for Humanity has been working hard to house those in need. On Long Island, a healthcare worker is getting a new home thanks in part to a group of Xavier students, all of them donating their spring break to giving back. Emily Druby spoke with them and has more. Xavier High School students rolling up their sleeves, spending their spring break doing manual labor under the hot Long Island sun, giving back and helping a healthcare hero, Nikisha. I was like praying and I prayed. I was like, as where I'm living right now, it's not livable. I live into an attic. There's no hot water in the shower. There's no heat. 
The Christian woman's prayers were answered when Habitat for Humanity picked her for a home. A nurse's aide who worked on the front lines during the pandemic. James Joyce and his fellow classmates using their time off from school to build what Nikisha calls her forever home. It feels good to know that I'm helping someone. Much needed help. They're the first school back since the pandemic. And we haven't really had any other volunteer groups that come out. Walter Mackey says they were stuck just using their staff to keep projects going. While they made it work, it's nice to have the extra help. He knows firsthand how important what they do is. I am a Habitat homeowner. Receiving his home in 1999 and a job offer shortly after. I usually say it's like winning the lottery. It's just the relief to knowing where you're going to be able to put down roots for the rest of your life. Roots, just like the ones these students are helping to create for Nikisha and her daughter. I'm so grateful to those students because, I mean, it's their breaks where a lot of kids will be home doing other things and they come and they help me, a total stranger, you know, giving me and, me and my daughter a gift. A big gift. Xavier was also at this site back in February. For the Jesuit school students, it's the perfect way to do God's work. When we learn of Ignatius Loyola and his teachings, he believes in work through service as well as St. Francis Xavier. And I think that's exactly what we're doing right here. We see God, we find God in all things, and service is one of those ways when we could see God. Right now, they're in the demolition phase of the building, but the home should be ready for Nikisha and her daughter to move in by the end of the summer. Now, it's not free. She is paying for it in what they call sweat equity, volunteering for other projects, paying it forward, just like these students. In East Patchogue, Emily Druby, Currents News. Still to come on Currents News, Pope Francis helps a priest celebrate his birthday with a handwritten note. And the pontiff receives a blast from the past in a near 70-year-old book. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. A Maltese priest got a handwritten birthday message from Pope Francis. The note, penned and signed by Francesco, thanks the priest for his life as a Franciscan. Father Dionysius Mintoff turned 90 on April 1st. Father Mintoff established the Pope John XXIII Peace Laboratory, which houses and feeds a number of adult asylum seekers. It also works to bring education and employment opportunities to the migrant community. Pope Francis also getting a blast from the past this week. He was sent a photo of an old registry showing he took part in an overnight Eucharistic adoration as a young man in Buenos Aires. If you look at this book, you'll see the signature for Jorge Bergoglio along with his brother Oscar. The image sent by an Argentine journalist reportedly moved the Holy Father, who recalled his visit to the Basilica of the Blessed Sacrament in the 1950s. He was around 18 or 19 years old at the time. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. I hope to see you again next time.